Okay, folks, let's get started. Get my cords put away here. So the last day before the exam, everybody's ready, everybody's anxious. Um, so just a few announcements to start. So first of all, let's remember about seating. All right, so seating starts here, one, three, five, et cetera, one, three, five, et cetera, one, three, five, et cetera. Same thing up there, okay? Last time, even though I told people that, I still had to tell people to get up and move. So if the person next to you is sitting in an even numbered seat, they're in the wrong seat, not you, all right? Uh, that's number one. Number two, um, material for the exam covers through the lecture on Monday. It stops there, okay? I had some trouble getting the video posted. It is now posted, and the highlights and all that stuff are all, all posted on the web, okay? Um, I will be videotaping the review session at 5.15 tonight, and I will get that posted as quickly as I can. I can't promise tonight, but I will certainly try my best to get it up there tonight, okay? All right, uh, let's see, what else are I gonna say? Um, make sure that you bring your ID with you on Friday, and we'll have a little different way we're gonna do things, but make sure you bring your ID with you on Friday. Some of you will have to show your ID to uh, get in, but everybody, everybody needs to bring their ID. Yes? Will we have another syllabus question on this exam? Well, since this exam is not comprehensive, uh, I would say no, but um, yeah. But on the final, you never know, right? Okay. Uh, let's see, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Oh, and the last thing, uh, there are no recitations next week, okay? So um, if you have a Tuesday recitation, I've told the TAs they are responsible for being available for you during that period probably in their office, you might want to check with them, uh, but you do not have to come to recitation. And the reason for that, of course, is that people on Thursday, maybe we should make people on Thursday come. Do you have Thursday? What's that? If I bring Thanksgiving dinner. Well, that's the last thing. I actually uh, am inviting all of you to my house for Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, I'm serious. Uh, what's that? Okay, come to my house. If you would like to come to my house for Thanksgiving dinner, I'd love to have you there. And uh, my wife and I put on a spread for people who are in town. And if you want to come Thanksgiving dinner, we'd love to have you there. So let me know afterwards, and we'll have a big Thanksgiving dinner. So you get extra credit, right? I mean, so there you go. <laughs> no, you don't get extra credit. So yes, ma'am. What room is the review session in? The review at a Wait, Thanksgiving dinner got everybody going there, didn't it? OK. The review session is in ALS 4001. ALS 4001. Okay. Um, now, what my plans are for today are fairly modest. I'm going to get through uh, the uh, discussion about glycolysis, uh, which I've already gotten a good deal through already. I'm going to talk about redox balancing, uh, which is important, and I will talk a little bit about entry of other sugars and regulation. I'm not planning to finish all the stuff that's on here. So we're actually in very good shape with, for where we need to be with stuff. And um, that will, may leave some time at the end if you would like to ask questions uh, for a, a mini review or something like that. I'll be happy to answer questions at that time. Okay? Okay. So uh, last time when I finished up, I was talking about this reaction right here, which is the reaction in which 3-phosphoglycerate is converted to 2-phosphoglycerate. And I pointed out that this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as a mutase. Specifically, it's phosphoglycerate mutase. And this mechanism involves creation of an intermediate <coughs> excuse me, uh, that is 2,3-BPG, which of course is how 2,3-BPG gets made in the cell. And that intermediate is stable and can be released by the enzyme. So at a low efficiency, that uh, molecule is released by the enzyme. And the release of that by the enzyme actually tells hemoglobin, hey, this is a rapidly metabolizing cell. It binds to hemoglobin and causes the release of additional oxygen. So that's kind of a cool uh, sidelight about uh, glycolysis. So it's through this mechanism that hemoglobin knows where the active metabolism is going on in cells. When you have active metabolism going on, you almost certainly have glycolysis going on. Almost certainly. Okay. Well, there's only two reactions left uh, to finish out the cycle. The first of these reactions uh, is catalyzed by an enzyme called enolase. And enolase uh, simply catalyzes the removal of water 
from 2-phosphoglycerate. Uh, that creates a molecule that has very high energy. That double bond with that phosphate and that carboxyl group really gives this guy the potential to do something, and the doing something uh, happens in the very next cycle. Okay? So this uh, loss of water is not an oxidation. It's removal of a proton and a hydroxyl group, so it's, it's, it's at the same energy state uh, as it's leaving here. And the most important thing is that we're making a very high energy intermediate. Okay? This high energy intermediate, phosphoenyl pyruvate, has as its abbreviation PEP. And it's a very easy way to remember it because you have a lot of PEP when you have a lot of energy. Uh, this guy has a lot of energy. Okay? It has enough energy in it, almost enough energy in it, to make two ATPs. Almost. It doesn't make two ATPs. It only makes one ATP. Okay? Well, what happens to that extra energy? That extra energy is released as heat. So one of the reasons why you get hot when you are exercising is you have reactions that have extra energy that are being released. This is a prime one. And this extra energy releases heat. You warm up. The reason you warm up is partly because of this reaction right here. Okay? Now this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called pyruvate kinase. And yes, this is the third enzyme that you need to know the name of. This guy is a very interesting and important enzyme. It catalyzes what I call the Big Bang reaction. The Big Bang. It's a Big Bang because, as I said, we've got all this energy. It drives this reaction. It's creating ATP, and it still is giving off a lot of energy. That's a Big Bang. Okay? Pyruvate kinase, as we shall see, is the third enzyme that is regulated. It's allosterically and covalently regulated. It's the first enzyme you've seen like that, allosterically and covalently regulated. Okay. Now, we'll talk more about the regulation later. But suffice it to say, it's very important that this enzyme be regulated. We'll see why when I go to talk next week about gluconeogenesis. Because in gluconeogenesis, we're going to run many of these reactions backwards. Okay? And this becomes a consideration with this enzyme. All right? So I'll talk more about that at that time. But that's kind of what's leading uh, up to that. The end product of this reaction, of course, is ATP. And you remember we, we made ATPs in the uh, earlier reaction when we did the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate going to 3-phosphoglycerate. That was producing one ATP, but then we had, remember, we have two molecules for each glucose, so we made two ATPs at that point. We have two of these guys starting with the glucose, so we're producing a total of two ATPs at this point. So our net gain right here at the end of glycolysis is a net gain of two ATPs. We've made four. We should be put two in. We also have produced at this point in glycolysis <clears throat> two molecules of NADH. That's because we had one oxidation done twice. Again, identical reactions. And the third product of glycolysis are these two pyruvates. Okay? We get two pyruvates. Now, those two pyruvates still have a lot of energy left in them. The energy of those two pyruvates is re realized when pyruvate itself is further metabolized. Okay? So pyruvate gets further metabolized. That's where a lot more energy comes out. So in summary, we've gone through glycolysis. We've seen that we have only two oxidations. We only have a net of two ATPs. So you think, well, there's really not that much energy in glycolysis. And directly, there's not. Okay? The energy from glycolysis is realized, ultimately, from this guy right here. Oxidation of pyruvate yields most of the energy that we get out of glycolysis. OK. Um, there's various summaries that are out there. Okay. I'm not going to expect you to memorize something, although I think there, you should obviously know the names of the intermediates. Um, and there's some delta G values, both delta G zero prime values and overall delta G. If you look specifically at the delta G column, you'll see something very interesting. Okay? There are three reactions in the delta G column that all have very negative delta Gs. Hexokinase, that was one of the regulated enzymes. Okay? 
the phosphofructokinase, that's one of the regulated enzymes, and pyruvate kinase, that's one of the regulated enzymes. Now, delta G reflects the actual energy in the cell. These are very negative. It's no surprise, as we'll ultimately see, that these very negative energies are on regulated enzymes. Cells have to regulate very, very favorable enzymes, as we shall see. So this is part of the reason why glycolysis actually has three uh, uh, regulated enzymes. OK, um, well, um, it's probably time that we should summarize this with a song. And so I would propose that we do that at this time, unless you'd like to save it for later. Later? Later? Now? It was, her, it was her idea. It wasn't mine. OK. So let's do it now. All right. This is to the tune of an old uh, song from The Sound of Music. Um, and uh, I call it The Sound of Glucose. All right? And we can all sing through the whole thing, even though it says instructor. So, aldehyde sugars are always aldoses. And if there's a ketone, we call them ketoses. Some will form structures in circular rings. Saccharides do some incredible things. Onto the glucose, we add a P to it. ATP energy ought to renew it. Quick rearranging creates F6P without requiring input energy. At a high rate, add a phosphate with PFK. F16BP is made up this way, so we can run and play. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Aldolase breaks it and then it releases DHAP and a few G3 pieces. But these both turn into 1,3-BPG, adding electrons onto NAD. Phosphate plus ADP makes ATP while giving cells what they need, energy, making triphosphates a situation. <laughs> I've lost my tooth. Oh, substrate level phosphorylation. 3-BPG, 2-BPG, lose a water. PEP gets a high energy state just to make pyruvate. You've got to have that pause. So all the glucose gets broken and bent. If there's no oxygen, cells must ferment. Pyruvate, lactate, our cells hit the wall. Some lucky yeast get to make ethanol. This is the end of your glucose's song. Unless you goof up and get it all wrong. Break it, don't make it to yield ATP. You'll save yourselves from futility. OK. Now, <clears throat> oh, didn't mean to do that. So now you, got, you can memorize glycolysis quite easily, I think, right? So, yeah. <coughs> All right. I wish I could sing. I really wish I could sing. All right. Now, um, glycolysis is a very interesting pathway in several respects. As I said, one way is that it has three enzymes that are regulated. That's unusual for a metabolic pathway. Another consideration for glycolysis is that that single oxidation reaction really is an important consideration in glycolysis. And I'm going to say a few words about that. So let's take a look at this sort of new schematic or new way of looking at glycolysis. Okay? What we see on the screen is something that might happen in a yeast. Okay? Now, how many people in here have ever made beer? And when you make beer, you put the bugs in there, and you put all the sugar and all the various other things in there. And what do you do? What's the next step? <coughs> Stir it up. What else? You cap it, right? And you cap it so that you don't have too much space in the top, right? Why? What you're doing is you're restricting the oxygen available to the yeast cells. Okay? You're restricting the oxygen. If you leave a big gap of air in there, you're going to get a very different kind of a beer, if any, than you're going to get if you leave a little bit of gap. Okay? That small gap is important for making alcohol. All right? So let's see how and why that happens. 
glucose starts along its merry way, and it's getting oxidized, it's getting oxidized, and it gets down here to this reaction. This is the one where we have the single oxidation, the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate going to the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This is the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase reaction, and it's at this reaction that NAD is required because NAD gets oxidized, to, uh, I'm sorry, NAD gets reduced to NADH as the um, uh, three phosphoglycer glyceraldehyde three phosphate gets oxidized itself. So glyceraldehyde three phosphate is getting oxidized, NAD is getting reduced. That means we have to have NAD for this reaction to go. NAD is a substrate. Everybody with me? NAD is a substrate. Well, the cell has a fixed amount of NAD. If it takes and it makes NAD into NADH, it has less NAD. The cell has to have a way of recycling NADH back to NAD, right? When we have oxygen, whether it's us or it's yeast or any cell that's aerobic, when we have oxygen, it's actually very simple. We go through the, we go through the um, electron transport system and we go through oxidative phosphorylation and NADH is converted back to NAD. That process requires oxygen. Okay? So if we have oxygen, the bottom line is we have plenty of NAD. Everybody with me on that? Plenty of oxygen, plenty of NAD. This happens in you as well. When you go running and you're running faster than your blood supply can deliver oxygen to your muscle cells, what happens is your muscle cells start running out of oxygen, but they've got to have energy, so they have to do some consideration as well. The yeast, when they run out of oxygen, they've got it figured out. You've got your own way figured out. So running out of oxygen could be a big problem. No cells don't have to starve to death. Okay? We think, well, I'll suffocate, right? Well, suffocation is a very different kind of a thing. If my muscle cells suffocated every time they ran out of oxygen, I wouldn't be around very long. Okay? So my muscle cells have to be able to adapt to short periods of time without oxygen, just as these yeasts have to be able to adapt to short periods of time without oxygen. Now, if I don't have oxygen, I can't automatically convert NADH back to NAD. I have to go to alternate means of doing that. Everybody with me? I see some heads nodding. Okay. That's what we see down here. The alternate means of dealing with an oxygen shortage have to do with pyruvate. Pyruvate can be reduced in yeast ultimately to make ethanol. It's a two-step process. This makes it look like it's one. It's actually a two-step process. Okay? But the product of this reduction is ethanol, which of course you go and drink in the form of beer or wine. And look at this, NAD. So fermentation is a way of supplying NAD to this glycolysis reaction. It's a way of keeping glycolysis going. Because if we don't, we're going to run out of substrate and we're going to have no glycolysis running. If we can't get glycolysis running, we're host folks. That's our main source of energy, especially when oxygen is limiting. Now, in our cells, we don't make ethanol. We make lactic acid or lactate, same thing. Lactic acid is produced by reducing pyruvate using NADH to NAD. Lactic acid is a three carbon molecule. Yes, our cells go through fermentation. It's called fermentation in us, although you don't think about it that way, but that's exactly what it is, it's fermentation. Okay, But again, in both cases, we're making NAD to keep this glycolysis reaction going. Make sense? Okay, now I'll tell you something probably, I'll, I may even say this again next time. I always, I always forget when I tell it the first time, but I'll tell it to you again next time. So uh, if I do, then you can just say it's, not, it's old doddering old Kevin Ahern who can't remember what he's done before. Maybe that'll help me to remember it, I don't know. All right, so this process occurs in bacteria. And this process in bacteria, as I said, is a two-step process. The first involves creation of a molecule called acetaldehyde. It's a two-carbon molecule that results from decarboxylating pyruvate. That doesn't really matter. You don't need to know this. I'm just telling you some, some things for fun. Okay? Everybody can relax. 
So, two step process. First, we make acetaldehyde, and then we convert acetaldehyde into ethanol. All right? Now, the conversion of acetaldehyde into ethanol requires the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase. Okay? So, bacteria have an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase that catalyzes the formation of ethanol. All right? We can't make acetaldehyde from pyruvate like yeast do. That's why we can't make ethanol here. Okay? And I know these genetic engineers in here are all of a sudden trying to figure out ways to do that, but okay. But I'll tell these genetic engineers something that may surprise them. And that is, we have plenty of alcohol dehydrogenase in our body. What's going on? Why do we have it if we can't make ethanol with it? Why do you suppose we would have alcohol dehydrogenase? We have a lot of it. So we can do what? Digest alcohol. What does that mean? What are you breaking it down to? <laughs> do you know? Okay. In fact, we don't digest it any further. Now he's really got you, right? Shall I leave this as an exam question? Okay. The key is in the reversibility of enzymatic reactions. What is alcohol dehydrogenase doing in the yeast cell? It's converting acetaldehyde into ethanol, right? What if we reverse that reaction? We convert ethanol into acetaldehyde. That's what our liver is doing. That's why you get a hangover, guys. When you start making acetaldehyde after you've had a lot of alcohol, you start making acetaldehyde, which is, in fact, part of the cause of your hangover. A little piece of trivia for you. Now, well, what if I knock out my <laughs> alcohol dehydrogenase, right? Then I get the alcohol effect all that much longer, right? I can save my beer budget. I have one beer and I can walk around with it for a week or so, right? Well, probably not a good idea, all right? Because you have alcohol dehydrogenase because alcohol itself is poisonous, okay? So too much, you hear about people dying of alcohol poisoning and so forth. That's there to hopefully protect you. But the side effect of that is that you do have side effects known as a hangover. Okay. Now we'll go back to things that you are responsible for. All right. I mentioned at the very beginning of talking about glycolysis that pyruvate could go three different directions. And the direction it went depended upon what cell type it was in and whether or not oxygen was available. Now this figure hopefully will make a little bit more sense to you uh, compared to what we had before. We produce pyruvate at the end of glycolysis. If we have abundant oxygen, that means we have abundant NAD. And when we have abundant NAD, we convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, which further gets oxidized, which makes even more NADH. But since we have plenty of oxygen, not a problem. However, when oxygen is limiting in a yeast or bacterial cell, they produce acetaldehyde, which ultimately produces ethanol. There's the alcohol dehydrogenase reaction right there. And there's the reaction that generates NAD. In our cells, we convert NADH into NAD and in turn produce lactate. By the way, lactate is not lactose. Don't confuse the two. They're very different things. Lactose is a disaccharide. Lactate is a three-carbon intermediate. Okay? But the result of this is, again, we're producing NAD so that we can keep glycolysis going. So everything seems to be fine and dandy, except for the fact once we consider, well, what happens with this? Yeah, question? The, the middle and the left are both no oxygen. Right? The ones on the middle and left are both when no oxygen is, abundant, is, no, is present. That's right. No oxygen is present. Well, we um, think everything's fine and dandy, but it's not quite fine and dandy, okay? Because right here, we have now taken NADH that was one of the products of glycolysis, and we've used it up. We did it for a good reason, to keep glycolysis going. But if I had this available to go into the uh, electron transport system, I, I could ultimately convert that into ATP. This is, each one of these guys is worth about three ATPs. I've flushed some ATP down the toilet. Moreover, I've made an intermediate called lactate that is a biological dead end. It doesn't go to something else. 
The only thing lactate can do is it can get reversed back to pyruvate when there's plenty of oxygen. When there's plenty of oxygen, levels of NAD go up, and this gets made back to pyruvate. Now, if we can't go this route over here to the right, which is what we can't do when we don't have oxygen, we give up a ton of ATP. In theory, starting with one glucose molecule and going through pyruvate and going through acetyl-CoA, the total yield of that, besides the carbon dioxide and the water, is 38 ATPs. When we go this route, when we go the fermentation route, the net gain is two ATPs. Two. Now, my question to you is, if you want to go out and you want to go on a diet, do you want to go aerobic or do you want to go anaerobic? Everybody says they want to go aerobic because you've gotten this notion in your heads over the years that aerobic is the best way to be. But what I just told you is the best way to be is anaerobic because you're getting fewer ATPs for every glucose that you use, which means you need to burn up more ATP. Does this mean I shouldn't exercise? You have to exercise to go anaerobic. What people are talking about as aerobic, they're really talking about anaerobic. Okay? The more you exercise, the more you go anaerobic, and the more you're going to burn up. Get that thinking out of your head. Okay? People think it's aerobic because oh, I'm breathing heavily. Well, of course you're breathing heavily. Yes, your body is trying to catch up with that deficit, but if you're doing it really right, it's not. Kind of cool, huh? Makes sense? Clear as mud? OK. I can see your attention is not on this new material. It's actually on the exam of the current material. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Uh, let's see. Lactate dehydrogenase, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what else do I want to say? That's not going to talk about that. OK, let me talk about the entry of other sugars. And um, I may say just a brief word about regulation, then I'll finish regulation on, on Monday with the rest of the stuff. So entry of other sugars. Glycolysis is what we call a central metabolic pathway because it's central to almost everything that happens inside of cells. And it's not something that is simply unique or specific to glycolysis. Okay? It's not something that's simply unique or specific to glycolysis. I'm, I'm sorry, to glycolysis, to glucose. I can't even think. I'm, I'm thinking about the exam, too. Okay? So this shows that other sugars can, in fact, be converted into intermediates in glycolysis and be metabolized. This is really useful because if I am drinking milk and I am getting lactose, Lactose, I remember, is part galactose, part glucose. It would be nice to be able to handle that galactose. And as we'll see in a minute, it's critical that we handle that galactose because if we don't, we have some, some real live problems. Okay? Now, so galactose can be converted ultimately into glucose 6-phosphate. Of course, that can be converted in the glycolysis cycle. Fructose can be very easily converted into fructose 6-phosphate and also converted into the glycolysis cycle. And other sugars can be uh, converted in a variety of ways uh, as well, and I won't talk about those here. But you can see a couple of examples right here. Now, um, galactose is metabolized. I'm going to show you the pathway by which galactose actually is converted to glucose 6-phosphate. So galactose, um, that we might get this from breaking down lactose. Galactose is converted into um, galactose 1-phosphate. There's an enzyme called galactokinase that does that. It's a reaction not unlike hexokinase, except for the phosphates going on to position one instead of going on to position six. Uh, in this case, it has to be al it's an alpha. Yeah, I, I believe that's right. Um, here's our galactose one phosphate, and this always confuses people, but it's not nearly as confusing as it looks like. Okay. What we're seeing is how this galactose 1-phosphate is ultimately being converted into glucose 6-phosphate. So bear with me. We start out with galactose 1-phosphate. And we start out with this UDP glucose. You've seen UDP glucose. Okay? We attach glucose to UDP. We've got UDP glucose. Right? Now, there is an enzyme that will now take that galactose and swap out 
the glucose. That is, it pulls this glucose uh, here off of the molecule. That glucose becomes this guy. And now we have UDP galactose. That's pretty straightforward. Swap glucose for galactose. <coughs> Notice that we've released a glucose 1-phosphate. Okay. There's an enzyme that will convert UDP glu the galactose in there back to a glucose. So what we've done is we've essentially converted galactose into glucose. And each time we turn this cycle, we release a new glucose 1-phosphate. Everybody understand the cycle? Galactose replaces glucose. Galactose gets converted to glucose. And then we just continue the cycle. Every time we turn, we release one more glucose 1-phosphate. Well, that's not glucose 6-phosphate. But there's an enzyme, as we'll see next week, that does this very easily. Very, very easily. So glucose 1-phosphate is very easily converted into glucose 6-phosphate. And because of this, we can convert galactose into glucose that can be, get energy in, in the cell. If there is a problem with this process, we have severe consequences that arise. Okay? If any of those enzymes in that last figure are missing, Galactose doesn't get converted to glucose, and galactose accumulates. When galactose accumulates, your body tries to deal with it, and it reduces it to something called galactitol. Galactitol, unfortunately, will crystallize and start the formation of a cataract. So if you are not metabolizing galactose properly, you're much more prone to forming cataracts in your eyes. In the, in the lens of your eye, these guys will crystallize, and they come from these type of crystals right here. OK. Yes? Is that why diabetics form cataracts more often? I don't know the answer to that. I, um, I can't think of a way that would happen, but I, I'd have to think about it. I, I don't know of a, of a mechanism off the top of my head, no. And there are other forms of w other ways of making cataracts. So that maybe it will tie in with one of, the, uh, one of those other ways would be my guess. Okay. Now the last thing I want to talk to you about is one of my um, pet passions, and I, and I think maybe I will stop with that. And then after I finish this, we'll, I'll take questions. So I won't talk about regulation at all today. Okay. And this actually is entry of fructose into the glycolysis pathway. Now. What I'm getting ready to give you is Kevin Ahern's grand theory of why high fructose corn syrup is bad for you. Okay? This is only Kevin Ahern's theory. All right? Somebody else may disagree with this. It's not anything except for Kevin Ahern's theory about why this is bad for you. But we're going to talk about that, okay? All right. Here's why I think high, how many people have heard of high fructose corn syrup? You know, if I asked that question about five years ago, I would get about three or four hands up. There's been a lot more awareness of what high fructose corn syrup is, and people have this notion that it's bad, but why is it bad? All right? Now, it's not completely known why it's bad, which is my, why, why my uh, idea here uh, is as good as anybody else's, I guess. Right? But we do know that there are some very bad things associated with high fructose corn syrup, many health effects. We also know that we have an obesity epidemic in this country. And I'm going to argue with you that the high fructose corn syrup is at the root of that obesity epidemic. Okay? And it goes like this. Okay. High fructose corn syrup. I drink Pepsi Cola. No, I don't, actually. But if I were drinking Pepsi Cola or any soft drink made in America, if you go out of America, you don't have this happen as much. Almost any soft drink made in America is made with high fructose corn syrup because it's cheaper than importing sugar, sugar being sucrose. We make lots of fructose in cornfields. So we have a lot of fructose that we can use to sweeten our drinks. And we do. So our drinks are full of, of, of fructose. All right? In the normal scheme of things, um, if I have uh, fructose um, in the metabolic pathway of glycolysis, it gets uh, metabolized OK. But what if I have extra fructose that I'm now getting from um, just a sole source of fructose. I mean, I'm getting more fructose than I would have gotten if I had just been eating sucrose. When I eat sucrose, I break down sucrose into, glycolo into glucose and fructose, right? So I get a little bit of fructose already. But what if I'm overloading that system? That's where my theory kicks in. All right. Extra fructose. What happens? When I get extra fructose, 
Fructokinase converts the fructose into fructose 1-phosphate, kind of like galactokinase converted galactose into galactose 1-phosphate. Right? That's fine and dandy. And this guy here, uh, there's another enzyme that we have that will break down fructose 1-phosphate, called fructose 1-phosphate aldolase. And what it will do is it will split this guy, just like aldolase does in the glycolysis cycle. It makes dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which you've seen before. And it makes glyceraldehyde, because remember, we've only got one phosphate now. So we don't have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We only have glyceraldehyde. But the cell says, oh, don't worry. I'll put a phosphate on there with triose kinase, and now I've got glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So what's the biggie? The product of fructose ultimately is dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is exactly what the products would be if I started with glucose. So hey, here you don't know what you're talking about. Why should this be causing obesity? There's one critical thing that we've bypassed here. What? No, it's not the Shalini's principle. There's a very critical thing that we've bypassed, and you guys know what it is. Huh. Where was that? Not hexokinase, but you're on the right track. Phosphofructokinase. You've just bypassed a regulatory step in glycolysis. In the normal glycolysis scheme, you have reasonable amounts of things. This gets stopped at that point. But when you start getting excess, you start making excess amounts of this because the body has nothing else to do with them. Well, once it gets past that regulated step of phosphofructokinase, this is now doomed to go make pyruvate because we've got that reaction, that big bang reaction that's going to be pulling everybody through. Pyruvate is a good thing. It's not a bad thing unless you have too much of it. If you have too much of it, pyruvate gets converted into acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA is how we make fatty acids. So by forcing this process with high fructose corn syrup, what we're doing is forcing the production of fatty acids that would otherwise not be made. Yes, ma'am? Okay, so you're saying that fructose-1-phosphatate alkylase is not being regulated? That's right. It's not regulated. Yeah. None of these are regulated. It just pushes it on through. It's bypassed a regulatory step in glycolysis. This, I think, and as I said, this is only my idea, this, I think, is why that obesity is an issue. You've made a way around what would otherwise be a nice control built into the glycolysis scheme, and it happens because you're dumping too much of this stuff into there. If you have a little bit of fructose in there or a normal amount of fructose in there, it's not as much of an issue as if you're bypassing it here. When you bypass it, the body's got nothing to do except make acetyl-CoA and convert that into fatty acids, as we'll talk about next term. OK, so that's my pet, pet theory about that, which is why I do not eat high fructose corn syrup. And I encourage every one of you to look at the labels of the things that you eat, and you'll be astonished at how frequently that it will say high fructose corn syrup. In fact, the high fructose corn syrup manufacturers are trying to get it changed so it's no longer called high fructose corn syrup, just in case you're wondering. So, OK. We've got about 10, 15 minutes. Um, if you want to leave, fine. If you want to ask questions, I'm here. So hit me. Or don't hit me. I shouldn't say that. The PIP2 path, the PIP2 and the uh, DAG? Sure. So go back to signaling. All right. So looking at signaling. OK. Uh, you are talking about, da, 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 da. okay, right here. So, this signaling pathway. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're talking about the, the protein kinase C. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, uh, ba, 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 right uh, here. This is what you're talking about, right? Okay. So PIP2 does appear in two places. So obviously, and, and that's because PIP2 is an important membrane lipid. So um, this shows the signaling that, that results in the activation of protein kinase C. This happens, I will remind you, first of all, as a result of interaction of a hormone with a 7TM receptor. I didn't show you that in class, and you're not responsible for that. The 7TM receptor activates a G protein 
and the G protein activates this enzyme called phospholipase C. It's the activation of phospholipase C that causes PIP2 to be cleaved into di uh, um, uh, diacylglycerol, called DAG, and IP3. IP3 is water soluble. It's released into the cytoplasm, whereas DAG remains associated with the membrane. IP3 goes to this receptor on the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum and literally opens it up, allowing calcium to escape from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. This causes cytoplasmic concentrations of calcium to increase. This might be good if I want to, for example, contract muscles. This could be good. Um, and more importantly for our purposes here, calcium is a second or third messenger, depending upon how you want to define it, that binds to protein kinase C. Protein kinase C is activated by two messengers. One is DAG, and the second is calcium, as shown here. The combination of these two cause protein kinase C to be activated. Protein kinase C can then go phosphorylate a variety of proteins and cause the cell to respond to that initial signal that it got. So protein kinase C, uh, once it's activated, can go and phosphorylate proteins and as, as a result cause the cell to respond to the signal that it has received. Yes, ma'am? Means to bind calcium and DAG, as shown here. Yes, ma'am. Um, you have PIP2 and IP3 as second messengers. What's the first messenger? Is it P protein or phosphorylate? So the first protein is always the hormone on the outside. And I, I haven't given you the hormone. I, I said it briefly in class. It's called one of, there, there's several that will do this. One's called vasopressin. Okay, but you're not responsible for the hormone. But yes, a hormone will always be the first messenger. Can you go over the blood clotting pathway? Okay, just a second. Let's see if there's a question up here on this. Yes. How do you turn PKC off? It's a good question. Um, how do you think you would turn PKC off? It's a very good question. OK, so one of the ways would be to start sequestering calcium. Because as you start to sequester calcium, calcium concentrations will fall. And since calcium is not covalently bound to the protein, once it comes off and goes on and comes on and goes off, it comes off sometime, it doesn't come back. So now you've started to change that enzyme by its loss of calcium, it will let go of AF DAG as that happens. So that mechanism of reducing the concentration of calcium in the cytoplasm is an important one. And you might say, well, how and when does that happen? Well, the reason that there's a lot of calcium in here is because there are pumps that pump the calcium in. So they're working all the time and will ultimately reduce that to the level that protein kinase C will fall. Make sense? OK. Other questions about this before I go on? Yeah, Anjali? Can calcium also be sequestered by Can calcium also be sequestered by calmodulin? It can, but that's a sort of a constant level. The pumps are physically reducing it. So, yeah. Good question also. OK. Other questions? Now, you had a question about blood clotting? Yeah. OK. Let me go, go pull up blood clotting for you. Uh, That would be catalytic strategies, I think. Uh, no. That would be after that. Allosterian regulation. Here we go. OK. And uh, the cascade scheme right there. OK. Yes, ma'am. Let me just go over it? Yeah. OK. So blood clotting is an important consideration for a uh, an organism with blood because you want to be able to stop that flow if somebody pokes a hole in you. And the blood has, it, it, blood has a set of proteins that are literally little triggers that can easily be set off that stimulate the rapid polymerization of proteins to make a blood clot. Okay, That's general background. Now, this scheme shows a lot of what's called a cascade uh, uh, set of cascading set of pathways that result in a giant amplification of the signal. So there's an initial signal of damage or something that happens up here. And that signal is communicated by activating a larger and larger and larger and larger number of these proteins to do something. These proteins are largely proteases. The most important one I've talked about right here is thrombin. Because thrombin is the last protease in this scheme. And it converts the inactive fibrinogen 
into the uh, monomeric unit called fibrin, and, mo and fibrin is the basis of the polymer that makes the clot. Okay? So prothrombin, uh, which is the inactive precursor of, of thrombin, is uh, important to understand. And it's prothrombin that partly plays a role in um, identifying where to uh, actually make the clot. And this happens, um, the way, one of the ways in which this is flagged is that prothrombin is modified, right here, prothrombin is modified by, uh, in a reaction that requires vitamin K. The vitamin K reaction results in the addition of a second carboxyl group to the side chains of glutamate on the prothrombin. So the side chains of glutamate in prothrombin now have two carboxyl groups, not one, and those two carboxyls will recognize and bind to calcium very readily. Okay? When they bind to calcium, prothrombin just basically stays there. And where's calcium important? Calcium is important because when you've damaged cells, there's calcium right there. It's, a, it's like the flag that here's where to be. So when prothrombin has been modified in this way, it stays at that site, it becomes converted to thrombin, and now it can convert thrombin into fibrin. I'm sorry, fib fibrinogen into fibrin. That's where the clot actually forms. The removal of the clot is also uh, of importance because we don't want to have a clot floating around in our body forever because uh, obviously that can cause problems with blockage of flow, etc. So the removal of the, of the clot is a function of an enzyme called plasmin, P-L-A-S-M-I-N. And plasmin exists in an inactive form known as plasminogen. The conversion of plasminogen to plasmin is uh, caused by another protease called tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA. That was, the, that was the enzyme I said that was the first recombinant molecule that was approved for use in humans, and it's used to treat uh, blockages, especially places in like the heart or in the uh, brain. Is that in a nutshell what you wondered? Yes. Okay. Ask a simple question, he won't shut up. Yes, Shannon. What are some of the um, mechanisms to, to avoid blood clotting? What are some of the mechanisms to avoid blood clotting? That's a good question, and it's more than I can really go into here. But suffice it to say that you want to have a signal that is very, it's like I say, it's, it, it's a very odd situation where you think about you want to have a hair trigger. You want to have this thing go off pretty readily because you, if you don't have it go off really readily, you bleed to death before the signal starts. But you don't want to have it going off in places that don't happen. You, your body does have things that will uh, um, reduce the likelihood of clotting. So we have a pro-clotter like vitamin K. We have anti-clotters like heparin. So heparin is um, a, um, it's one of the uh, proteoglycans, and it will actually reduce the likelihood of clotting happening. But that's independent of this. But there is, as you can imagine, there's a lot of controls built into how this might happen. I, I, I won't have time to go into it here. Yes? Okay. Yes? Okay, his question, a good, it's a good question. I've been asked this by several people, so thank you for bringing it up. So the HER2 receptor um, looks like the EGF receptor. And I said it can bind to the monomer of EGF receptor and stimulate that process. His question is, does it need to have EGF to do that? And the answer is no. Okay, it does not. So this is one of the reasons why having too much of that receptor is a problem because it starts stimulating false signaling for cells to divide, and that's why the division becomes uncontrollable. Okay, I think we're out of time. We need to get out of the way for the next class. I'll see you guys on Friday. Don't forget, get in and get seated quickly, and don't forget your IDs.
why doesn't like the reaction? And then why doesn't the reaction? You know, I guess like if it's positive, why doesn't it go backwards back to?